Okay, let's pick up where we left off in 1.3 in our pre-calculus book, talking about, we're going to finish up the lesson discussing intermediate value theorem and end behavior. So, my goal is to simplify this math speak. If you want to read it, that's great, but I'm going to try to simplify it for you so you can understand it. And what it tells you, what our intermediate value theorem says, if you have some value of your function, remember value refers to that y-coordinate. If you have one value and you have another value on your function and your function is continuous, then there has to be some value in between the two of them. That's all it says. Now, the key to it, obviously, is that our function has to be continuous. If I were to draw a graph and say, yeah, here's a value of my function, and here's another value of my function, but is nothing in between because my function is not continuous. Now, why is that important to us? Because when we look at our graph and we can find those values of our function that are positive or greater than zero, and we can find those values of our function that are negative or less than zero, then we know there has to be some values in between that are equal to zero. That helps us find the zeros of our function, okay? Because remember the zeros are also our x-intercepts, sometimes referred to as roots of an equation, okay? So the examples of what we're going to have to do with this concept determine between which consecutive integers the real zeros of each function are located on the given interval. So our interval is given to us right here. So we're going to go put our values in x, f of x. We're going from negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, pause, go plug them in, go put the values into your table, do what you need to do, and then start back up and we will determine what we have. So you should have, when you plugged them in, should have gotten that negative 3 gave you a positive number. I'm not so interested in the number, I just want to know if it's positive or negative. Negative 2 gave me a negative number. Negative 1 was negative. 0 was negative. 1 was negative. 2 was negative, 3 was positive, and 4 was positive. So what does this tell us? This tells us that we have a sign change. That's what we're looking for. When did it go from positive to negative or negative to positive? And that's in between these numbers. Okay? When my x values, that's what these answers are. We want to know that the consecutive integers on the given interval, and that interval are your x values. So your answer is going to be your x values. So the two intervals I have, negative 3 to negative 2 has a 0 on it, and 2 to 3 has a 0 on it. Okay, let's go look at the next one. Now, that worked out nicely. As I said, let's look at this next one. We have f of x equals 8x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x minus 1 between negative 5 and 0. And really, you should go back. I'm going to go back. I'm going to step back. It's always a good idea to use that graphing calculator to check when you're doing your work. So I do want to point out, I think I've put this equation in here. I did. I put the table. So this is our graph. We're going between negative 3 and negative 4. We can see this is negative 1, negative 2, and 3. So I have clearly a 0 between negative 2 and negative 3, and another 0 between positive 2 and positive 3. So that works out. I, I, I want to have the visual to confirm what we did algebraically. All right, so back to our next function. we got to go build our table. I have x and f of x, and this time my interval is between negative 5 and 0. So negative 5, negative 4, 
negative 3, negative 2, 1, and 0. All right. Go build your table. Pause. Put the values in. Come back. Now that you're back, you should know that negative 5 was a negative on your, your table. Negative 4 was negative. Negative 3 was negative. Negative 2 was negative. Negative 4 was negative, and 0 was negative. So it appears there are no zeros between negative 5 and 0. I encourage you strongly to go look at your graph. Okay, so let's go put it in our graph and calculator. Back to our Inspire. Control. I'm going to add a page. I'm going to put a graph on it. And I'm going to go type in our function, which is 8x cubed. Right arrow to bring myself back down. Minus 2x squared. Minus 5x. Minus 1. Hit enter to graph it. Okay. They asked us to look at the interval from negative 5 to 0. So I'm going to go just click on here. And let's make it negative 5. And remember I can hit tab and go to the next one. We can still make it 6. And we can go 5. And we can go to negative 6. Now, hit enter to stop. If this is a problem, we're looking for between integers. These are not tick marks by integers. So again, when we're here, we can click on Menu and go to Window and go to Window Settings. And on our scale, our X scale, I don't want it to be Auto. I want to enter the value, and I'm going to enter the value of 1 and click OK. And now I have my integers. So they asked me for the interval from negative 5 to 0, and do I have any zeros in that between consecutive integers? We got negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and 0. So our table didn't give it to us because it didn't, it came back down so quickly. So that's why it's important to look at the graph sometimes as well. So the answer to this particular problem is going to be between negative 1 and 0. And the reason we didn't see it on our table is because we only used integers. We would need to make our table values smaller to confirm that. Okay. Last thing on here, we've got in behavior. It's exactly what it sounds like. We're talking about in behavior. We're going to use the concept of a limit, but all we're doing is basically looking at the left arrow on my graph and looking at the right arrow on my graph. I am interested in the x-axis. Basically, that's what this is pointing out because the left arrow means my x is going to negative infinity and the right arrow means x is going to positive infinity. That's my x value. That's what this is telling you right here. Okay? This is my left arrow as x goes to negative infinity. This is my right arrow. Okay? In previous classes, you might have said up, up, down, up, down, down to describe in behavior. Now we're just going to describe it mathematically. So let's look at our problems. Use the graph of each function to describe its end behavior. Support the conjecture numerically. That would be looking at tables uh, with your graphing calculator. And in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to do that. If you want some help, come see me, please, and I'll be happy to show it to you. But we have our function, g of x equals x cubed minus 9x plus 2. And I'm looking for the end behavior. So if I'm looking for end behavior, I want to know what's happening. As x goes to negative infinity, that is my left arrow. What happens as x goes to positive infinity? That is my right arrow. Okay, so hopefully you can see what is my left arrow doing. You tell me that the left arrow, we write it f of x, that means the y values are getting smaller and smaller or going to negative infinity. My right arrow, are those values are going to positive infinity. And that's all you have to write. Tell me what the left arrow is doing. Tell me what the right arrow is doing. 
So you got to keep up with which one's left and which one's right. So we'll stick with that to try to simplify things. My left arrow, okay, as x approaches negative infinity, f of x is going where? It's going up, and up is positive infinity. Okay? The right arrow is when x is going to positive infinity. That's my right arrow. And what is it doing? f of x is going towards negative infinity. Okay? Seems easy enough. Sometimes they don't go to infinity, so we have two more examples. And then we're done. So, use this graph. We're doing the same thing to describe the end behavior. All right, so the hardest part is to making sure that you know which one is the left arrow and which one's the right arrow. Okay, the left arrow out of one, two, three, four is the one that's going towards negative infinity. So this is my left arrow. And which one is my right arrow? This one right here. Now, to simplify things, I think it might be easy to show you. Uh, I'm going to put a line on this graph. Let's make it, uh, we'll put a red line on here. I'm going to draw the line and move it. So if I take this line and I put it up on my graph, you will see that both of these are actually approaching the same number. And what does that number look like? You can tell if I'm counting by twos, that's about halfway between. So in each case, the value of my function is getting closer and closer to three. And if you remember from last year, this is an example of a horizontal asymptote. But this is how we write our answer, just like we've been doing. All right, let's go look at the last example. Again, left arrow means x approaches negative infinity. Right arrow, oops, that's not right. Right arrow is x approaching positive infinity. So my left arrow is here. My right arrow is here. I'm going to go draw another line. Uh, let's go with red again. And I uh, didn't get it. Come on. Oh, i got to draw the line. That's why. Click on it. I want red. Line. Red. Draw my line. Okay. Now we're going to go move our line onto the graph, and let's see what number it's approaching. And about the same one. We're going to go with negative 3 again. That's close enough. f of x is approaching negative 3. And actually, both of them are, again, approaching the same thing. So you see, there are times when it will approach the same. There are times when it won't. Okay? It's all about looking at those left and right arrows. And that sums up our end behavior.